Well, welcome to this old pew. My name is Dave Sunberg, and I will be your host. Today, I would like to, uh, let's keep it at home in Iowa. I would like to share with you an episode that Pastor Carol produced in her Pondering series of devotionals that she produced for the Methwick community. This is an episode that first aired on Monday, October 26th of 2020. I think you'll like it. So let's join Pastor Carolyn. Let's see what she has to say. So our reading this day is Grace, The Return from Exile, Mary L. Frazier. Mary L. Frazier was a pastoral counselor and ordained elder in the United Methodist Church. She received her PhD from Claremont School of Theology. She holds degrees from the University of California at Berkeley and Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. She was directing the Office of Pastoral Care and Counseling for the Iowa Conference of the United Methodist Church until a year ago, and now she is serving as senior pastor in Ames, Iowa, Collegiate United Methodist. So we begin. So we begin. This morning, a wet spring wind holds its hands around the life of my backyard. I sit in my Adirondack chair, surrounded by trees and lush green plants. The yard slopes down to a walking path and pond where a family of wood ducks bobs and nestles with their young, as do Mama and Papa Goose, who watch over their newly hatched goslings. Here in this moment is life without exile, life without any refugees from their own habitat or experience. I watch and listen, smell and feel the great quiet of God's love deepening in my heart, in my mind at rest, and in my emotions now tuning with the infinite. Invitation to enter this landscape of peace feels like a prayer offered on my behalf. I would like to name this moment completely as grace this being contained in the breadth of the planet, even in the smallness of my backyard, even in the protected shelter of a tiny enclosed area of wood, pond, path, and trees. The kingfisher dies for its breakfast. The clouds thicken with threads of rainy nourishment for the earth. The ducks and the geese elicit a beauty of all that is unconsciousness, simply itself, unable to be other than what it is. My soul bows before such balance, before the justice of life held in nature. But I believe as I sit here this morning that what I experience in such an alive and filled way within this natural grace is the tributary of gratitude a necessary finger of grace, but not its entire flow. Being held in this shelter of life creates great spaces of thanks within me. I am glad I have arrived here at this moment, in this time, from all the long way of my journey thus far. At midlife, I feel the privilege of age, I have, without knowing it, become one of the mothers on the planet. With my own opinions, my my girlhood is gone. My children are old enough to study their own opinions and live their lessons without my supervision. My colleagues are as, as many younger as older than me. I become one of the mothers whose soul moves with the geese and ducks, roots deep with the ash trees, 
planted years ago. Gathers with the thickening clouds once again and again in the right season. The language of my heart has all, has all on its own become a language of love for what is vulnerable and creative, for what is unconscious and simple, for tomato soup and jelly sandwiches, or for rice and maize, for wiping tears and listening to stories, for intellect and heart, for doing and being. I am deeply grateful. I don't really know how this happened, yet here it is. A more mature time has come. It is gratitude. What others bear, the advent of grace, the mystery of it, the nature of its goodness. In my experience, grace always appears in the profound return to the center of oneself and often occurs in pain as well as in relief. Gratitude is a deep part of grace, but grace is an even more encompassing current in the flow of life. Long ago, while pastoring in the Northeast, I gave up on the notion of grace as rescue or grace as the God version of the knight suddenly riding in on the white horse to save the princess. Instead, I came to know grace as the ingredient of welcome in the midst of exile. Grace, I realized, is the substance of love, forgiveness, and hope. Or one might say the molecular structure of all that returns us to the center of ourselves in affirmation and resurrection power. Resurrection power is what creates and recreates the essence of ourselves as testimony in the universe of God's unique fingerprint in every living thing. Indestructible and filled with light, we see the face of Jesus in all the faces of those who claim this energy. I think I first understood how grace returns to us, or returns us, to ourselves when I began ordained ministry at the age of 30. During that summer, my first pastoral care assignment was to another woman of 30, also a professional, also highly educated, who, unlike me, had been diagnosed two years earlier with multiple sclerosis. She could no longer govern the movements of her body, could no longer speak, and had to be lifted from bed to chair with a complicated series of levers and straps. Unable to have a conversation, we agreed through gestures and signs that I would read to her. With that covenant formed, twice a week I would go and sit by her bedside to read stories and poems for an hour or so. By the end of the summer, she and I were quite close although she had never actually spoken to me. In August, she took a sudden turn for the worse, went into the hospital, and threw a blood clot to her lungs. At the funeral, her two young children of five and three let balloons go, while her husband put his face into his hands and wept. I learned about grace then, not in the serenity of nature, but in the warp and woof of complicated human relationships. This grace was the honest connection of people with their souls, with whom and what they love, with all they believe, with the power of commitment and the grief of loss. Grace is to know these movements within the universe, not in some abstract way, but intimately like being aware of your heartbeat as you turn the corner upon something beautiful and startling, or greet a margin of fear when you listen to the prognosis for one you love or for yourself. The emotions, the thoughts, the awareness of the precious quality of life and death allow us to enter the realm of grace. And once we cross that threshold, 
There's no going back. We have been baptized in a way that creates a moral conversation around the demands of love and forgiveness and hope. Within the texture of these gospel demands and the conversation they elicit, we understand who we are and who our neighbor is. As we love, forgive, and hope, we see ourselves and our neighbor in the way God does. As fellow pilgrims on the planet, as children of God's mind, as we allow ourselves to see in this way, we become visible in authentic ways to others as well. This is the story of grace. The last funeral I conducted in the 20th century was for a 12-year-old boy who died on the night before Christmas Eve. He had lymphoma and had been struggling with the disease for two years. The morning of Christmas Eve, I went to visit his mom and dad. They were so sad. They were so very sad. We decided to postpone the funeral until three days after Christmas in order to give family members time to arrive and to protect the future of the holiday for the other children in the home. But as I listened to this mother and father, I knew there was no protection from their loss for them or for any of us who were involved. And as the century came to an end, I came to believe anew that it is the very lack of protection from the great experience of, experiences of love and loss that allows us again to enter the landscape of grace. Grace means that we return from exile to the depths of our lived experience, no longer estranged from the immediacy of our relationships with others or our environment or even ourselves. We begin truly to experience love, forgiveness, and hope for ourselves and for our neighbors. We realize that grace is not about being saved or rescued from the suffering that mirrors the strength of our love. We find instead that because we love, precisely because we love, we live in the center of ourselves through the joys and hurts, through the justice and injustice, through the haves and the have-nots. In grace, we say, I am alive on this planet. I have loved and I have been loved. This is my moment of wholeness. I see the tree and the bird. I see the woman and the man. Perhaps this is true enlightenment, true epiphany. What would grace, unshackled from its exile and categories of rescue, look like? I think it would look like mercy running wild across the planet from Darfur to Sri Lanka. I think it would look like rivers of forgiveness connecting Palestine and Israel and the United States and Iran, South and North Korea, and all the places of discord and distrust. I think it would look like deep and abiding concern for the birds flying above my pond this morning or for the red-eared turtle in its ancient wisdom connecting us to mud and insects and water and lily pads. Grace would look like mom and dad weeping over the casket of their beloved son and little girls sending off balloons for the mother they lost. Grace would look like the people who wrap their arms around the hurting to hold the experience of being alive in solidarity. We would return from the exile of disbelief, relentless self-criticism, and mindless attacks on other creatures, including the human creature. We would laugh and weep in grace, united with the center of our being, the still point where God breathes the breath of life into us. And we know in this journey on this planet, that we have each other. The earth that supports us, 
and the abiding love of the eternal spirit of all that lives. My. The gratitude then. My. The thanksgiving on that day. Lord, the grace abounding. So we end our day now with this poem by J. Barry Shepherd. Trisagian. A lingering holds my hand from the switch inside the study door, leads me inside caught at the trembling threshold to glance across the floor toward the window through which there pours a new uncanny light to permeate this solitary pre-dawn hour. No frost-encrusted moon or stars are visible above, yet a definite radiance lights the surface of last evening's unexpected snowfall, reveals a scene of branches and twigs and trunks aligned, outlined against this gentle luminosity. A fresh-discovered world of black and white. No either-or demanded, nothing to be approved, deplored, no need to choose, divide the right from wrong, the damned from the elect. Rather a surprising, subtle, holy, holy, holy. A glory as of hovering seraphim that gleams just beneath the skin of everything that is and claims and blesses, welcomes me as part and thankful parcel. So ends our readings this day. So ends our time together. May you be blessed in this day. Amen and amen.